How many believe God reigns? Because uh, if we didn't believe that, we'd be a little messed up this morning with everything that's going on in our whole world. But the truth of the matter is, we know the end of the story. And I know without a doubt, we win in Christ. Isn't that the good news? So I say that to encourage you, don't let all the things going on in the world bother you. Let it go. Jesus said some things, and this isn't part of a message, but I can't help it. Um, the things we're going to get worse towards the end, right? People are going to say what is good is bad, what is bad is good. He says there's going to be an increase of wickedness, even so much so that the heart says most will fall away. Many will fall away, he says. So it's really important for us as children of God to keep our focus on the King. Make sure our eyes are on Jesus so that we know the author and the perfecter of our faith. That we know he's gone to prepare a place for us. That we know he doesn't leave us or forsake us. Greater is he who is in us than he is in the world. That matters to me. I don't know about you. So when I see all this stuff going on, everybody doing all their crazy stuff, I just go, yep, yeah, it's going to get worse. But I think for believers, we're standing in Christ. And we really understand who we are in Christ. We can be set apart even though we're in the world. We can bring hope when there's no hope. We can bring help when there's no help. We can bring forgiveness when there's no forgiveness. It's all those things, the love of Christ, permeating all of them, and allowing them to use it. So I just want to encourage you this morning as we approach the Word and we're studying in Mark, and we'll be in Matthew and Luke and John at different times as well. We're more in Matthew today than we are in Mark, because Mark doesn't say much about this particular topic that we're talking about today, Jesus' temptation. And I want to get more of the story. Because there's a whole bunch there for us. But I just want to encourage you in Christ. You're more than a conqueror in Christ Jesus. We've overcome by the blood of the Lamb. Father, we just pray in the mighty name of Jesus this morning. We want to thank you that our Lord, our Savior, our Redeemer is the King of the universe. That you defeated the enemy when you died on that cross. You shed the blood for our redemption. And you were buried. And you conquered death and hate. And you were raised. And you're seated in all authority and power and glory. And your word says you intercede for us daily. Oh Lord, thank you for the hope that is ours in Christ. That we're heirs of your kingdom. Lord, would you encourage each one today. Lord, would you help us to learn the Jesus way. That we might walk in a manner that reflects you in a culture that desperately needs hope. We just bless your name. We pray you bind the strong man from this place in the mighty name of Jesus. Lord, allow your spirit to come and open our hearts and the eyes of our hearts and open our ears. Lord, may we have conviction where needed. Lord, may we respond where needed. May we repent where needed. Lord, may you have all of us and all God's people said, Amen. Amen. So we're starting in Mark chapter 1 as we're getting into. Jesus' temptations. Last week we talked about the baptism. I'm going to cover a little bit more about that. But I want to read the scripture passage to us, both in Mark and in Matthew. And then we're just going to, we're going to get in and kind of mine the nuggets of gold that are there for us. Mark chapter 1, verses 12 and 13. It says, Immediately the Spirit impelled him to go out into the wilderness, and he was in the wilderness for 40 days being tempted by Satan. He was with the wild beast, and the angels were there ministering to him, so for the most part, and a little bit, a few other places, but we're going to be in Matthew chapter 4. Starting at verse 1, and we read verses 1 through 11, just so you can have a context to begin to think about as we break this down. Listen to what it says. It says, Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil, and after he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he then became hungry. And I always want to go, you think? <laughs> Woo! And the tempter came and said to him, If you are the Son of God, command that these stones become bread. But he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. <clears throat> so then the devil took him into the holy city and had him stand on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, He will command His angels concerning you, and on their hands they will bear you up, 
so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. Jesus said to him, on the other hand, it is written, you shall not put the Lord your God to the test. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to him, all these things I will give to you if you fall down and worship me. Then Jesus said to him, go, Satan, for it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Then the devil left him, and behold, angels came and began ministering to him. So today we're dealing with the topic of temptation as a whole, and we're looking here that Jesus, our King, our Messiah, was tempted. But I want to go back just a little bit because if you feed into what just happened, to what's going on now, it just it will unwrap in a very powerful way to us. So before what happened, Jesus came in Galilee of the Jordan, coming to the Jordan to be baptized by John, right? And if you remember, it says John was just doing what John does. He's baptizing. And as he's baptizing, all of a sudden he looks up and there's Jesus. And John goes, oh! Do you come and baptize me? I need to be baptized by you. And part of the struggle, if you remember, was that John knew what his baptism meant. John's baptism was a baptism of repentance for sin. And here's Jesus, who's perfect, and John's like, uh, no, in fact, in the Greek, as I shared with you, not only did he just try to prevent him, but he's probably climbing out of the water saying, there's no way that this is happening. And Jesus said, John, allow it so that we might fulfill all righteousness. And so a lot of people wrestled with that for years I have as well. The thing that I know when I study scripture, Jesus didn't need to fulfill all righteousness on his behalf. As we learn in 2 Corinthians 5, 21, we get the answer. It says, He who knew no sin became sin on our behalf, that we might become what? The righteousness of God. So Jesus was radically identifying with who he's coming to save. Sinners. Those who knew they were sinners. Those who knew they were in trouble. Those who understood that they were lost. And Jesus was coming. And part of that was, it was a prediction of his death, burial, and resurrection. So it was the beginning of his ministry. And we have the second thing that happened. The Holy Spirit came down in the form of a dove. And as we look at that, that anointing wasn't the anointing you and I get. The anointing we get was tongues of fire. Because we're going to what? When the Holy Spirit comes upon you, you will be my, you'll, you'll receive authority and power. But you will be my witnesses. You're going <coughs> to testify about me, by what I'm doing in your life. And... So, Jesus' anointing, the dove, you remember, represented sacrifice. It was the, they sacrificed doves all the time because that's what the normal person could afford. And so they understood. But John tells us what? In the Gospel of John, Behold, John the Baptist speaking, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And Jesus is going to be the sacrifice, the Lamb of God. And so the third thing that happened is Father spoke. And said, this is my son in whom I'm well pleased. And, and so one of the things we know is that the father always, if you look in the Old Testament, I use Cain and Abel as an example, but that he approves of the sacrifice. And he's saying, I approve of your sacrifice. I'm with you. And that's pretty powerful stuff. Jesus radically identified with us. Jesus came for the sole purpose to rescue sinners, to rescue you and me. He came to rescue the whole world. So when you quote John 3.16, for God so loved the world, it means a little bit more when you realize Jesus deliberately came to radically identify with us. Now our baptism, if you remember, is one that rad radically identifies, now it's not John's baptism of repentance, but it's a baptism of radically identifying with the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. And I am connected to Christ. My salvation comes through Jesus. And so we come into this text, and something happens, and it says in... Gospel of Mark that he was propelled immediately into the wilderness. So I want to say something here that I believe that what happens when you, he began his ministry, the first thing that happens, he has an encounter with the enemy of our souls, who's called what? The God of this world. And Jesus just declared war. More than we could ever imagine. I don't know if we grasp what's happening here. But Jesus came and said, you will no longer rule, you will no longer reign, you will no longer keep my people in bondage. Just think what he did. Everything he did, everything he did, we'll talk about this more later, is that he cast out 
demons. He healed the sick. He raised the dead. Everything that sin brought, sickness, disease, all those things. Jesus saying, I am the author of life. I am the healer, the deliverer. I am the redeemer. Man, that's pretty powerful. So he declares war. It says then Jesus in verse 1 of chapter 4 of Matthew, led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. Did that ever bother you? The Spirit led him into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. So I would almost say it another way. Well, if you look at Luke chapter 4, it says it this way. Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, was led into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And another way to think about this is Jesus is led into the wilderness to confront the devil. To say, I am here. Isn't it interesting? It says up here that he arrived. <laughs> I'm here. Take notice. The enemy's just arrogant enough <coughs> in many ways to think that he can win. He's still fighting to win. He's still at large. We haven't had the consummation of all times and he's not thrown in the lake of fire yet, so he's still there. But he says he's led by the Spirit in the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. Now I want to talk about this word tempted for just a little bit, or temptation. I don't know about you, but most of the time when I hear that word, I think of temptation is something bad. Don't you? I hear people saying, oh Lord, don't let me be tempted. I mean, we have it in the Lord's Prayer, Father, lead us not into temptation, right? But I, that's a little bit further down the path than we're talking. Leave it into sin itself, because he won't. Protect us from the wiles and the snares and the plans of the enemy, of course. But temptation in and of itself is neither a good word or a bad word when we study it out in the Greek, and I thought that was interesting. Something about temptation that I didn't understand is temptation will bring out of you either good or bad. Oh. Maybe that's what James is talking about in chapter 1 when he says, Consider it all joy when you face every kind of trial, temptation, and so on. Temptation literally means test, trial, prove, refine. It can have all those kind of meanings in it. Temptation from the enemy is always evil, right? And being tested to see what comes out of you can be something really powerful and good, but it also can refine us, right? It's just interesting when I began to study this whole word of temptation. Our problem is, most of the time when we've been tempted, if we're real, I don't know about you, but I'm not tempted in something that I'm not tempted with. Does that make any sense? Because sometimes we look at people and go, I don't get why that's hard for them. You yeah. ever thought that? Because you're not tempted in that! <laughs> but if it's something you're tempted in, it's real easy to go, the little won't kill me, will it? <laughs> right? The thing I find about sin, because that's when sin gets, when temptation gives birth to sin, when you actually live it out, put feet to it, it brings forth what? It always brings forth death. It's always going to harm you. Why do you think the Lord says, be alert, the devil prowls around like a roaring lion looking for whom he may devour? You better be ready. You ever notice that he doesn't always attack you rarely when you're what? Strong. We're going to learn some things about that as we get into this, but when I think about temptation, one of the things I thought about in James, there's different avenues here, but in, when we look at Jesus' temptations, just overall, and we think that we're going to talk about each one of those, but here it talks about at the end of the 40 days and 40 nights, my belt's going to drive me crazy until I get through that. Look, thank you. <laughs> Still flopping out there. Um, it says he tempted him in three different ways, but when you look at Mark and you look at Luke, it said he was tempted for 40 days and 40 nights. I think we have also the we got to hear about the last temptations that came to him. But when you when you go to some place like Hebrews 2:18, it says because he himself suffered when he was tempted, he's able to help those who are being tempted. Meaning because he went through these temptations, he he comes to our aid, right? We have help. I'm not left alone to fight this thing anymore. I'm left alone to fight it. I don't know about you, but anybody ever felt in their temptations? If you don't all raise your hand, you're a liar. 
whether it be gossip. You ever heard that voice say, don't say it, don't say it, and you say it. <laughs> and, they, and I walk away and you're like, oh, I know I wasn't supposed to do that. The more you don't say it, the more you won't say it. You, you know how things work? You know, the more you learn to have control. It's like going to the gym to work out. I tell people all the time, you know, the first two weeks you're going to hate me if you go to the gym with me. Maybe a month. But if you get a habit in place where you're actually doing stuff and taking care of yourself or whatever, and you put everything in place, you got to develop. You've had all bad habits. You know what I'm saying? So this is what we're talking about. We've had all bad habits, sinful habits that we've been prone to and certain things that we're all stronger with or weaker with. And, and it's just, I think the comical side of that is, and we got to be honest, but all of us, if we're not careful, look down on somebody who struggles with something we know. That's one of those where you got one finger pointing and five pointing back type thing. That's where Jesus says things like, take the log out of your own eye so you can pick the speck out of your brother's eye. I think it means something even more than that. We're not the one to pick that out. We can be there to encourage and strengthen. But you can tell truth and you can walk with somebody, but I can't judge them in the sense of, why can't they get over this? Because I could ask myself the same question with this issue over here, or this issue over here. But we're supposed to spur one another on toward love and good deeds in Christ. So we got to walk this journey together and help each other. But this, this temptation that's going on here, and you look at Jesus' life, and he, he, I love the Hebrews 4.15 as well, because what does it say, you know? Hebrews 4.15 says, Jesus was tempted in every way, yet was without what? But he was tempted in every way. <clears throat> Pretty powerful stuff going on here, and Jesus facing this, and we're looking at this. And another thing that hit me: it was forty days, and forty nights without food or water. <clears throat> it makes bells go off in my head. Number one, it's, it's not natural; we can't survive, but it's supernatural. Okay. Really happens. So I have people all the time saying, We're going to go on a 40 day fast. Like Jesus. I'm like, Good luck with that. <laughs> I want to see that. Oh, no, we're going to drink water and cheese and protein. I said, Quit calling it a Jesus fast thing because it's not. I mean, if you do that for a day or two, maybe. But 40 days is a miracle. I don't, God only called a couple people to do that. And there's one other person, right? Moses? Up on the mountain, 40 days and 40 nights. We turn back and look at Exodus and we look at Deuteronomy and other places that talks about Moses being on the mountain, get the tablets, 40 days and 40 nights without food or water. That's a miracle. But what's really cool about it is it teaches that one like Moses will come, but greater than Moses. Here Jesus is in the wilderness, how long? 40 days, 40 nights. He's a rock. He's here. He's here for us. But I think about how hard that would be without, and in the midst of that, he was tempted in every way. We could read about the last one, but he was tempted in every way. I've been tempted in quite a few ways. How about you? But it's over a course of time in my life. And I think it's really important as we get into this to understand that When it comes to temptation, we're not just fighting an enemy, but we're also fighting a, a fallen nature that's within us. We're not just fall, fighting a fallen nature that's within us, but we're also fighting a world and a spirit and a world system that's all going this way and living this way. And God's calling us to go this way and to live His way. Big difference, isn't it? So we have a lot sitting in front of us. But I'm so excited to know the one in whom my faith is in, the one who lives in me, because I'm a temple of God, is greater than he is in me, than he is in the world. All things are possible through Christ Jesus our Lord. We can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. So I want to get into this a little bit deeper and work through this. One of the things that happens here, and I think it's fascinating before I get into the temptations, is that when you think about Jesus, he actually suffered in his temptation. Because it was so intense. But it doesn't mean he suffered because he wanted to 
sin. The other thing I want you to understand as we get into this, temptation in and of itself is not sin. Isn't that good news? Yes. I have people all the time say, I just want that temptation to go away. And I said, when you get to heaven, it'll go away. But you can say no to it today. Because you have the power of the risen Christ within you. You've been raised with Christ to live a new life. You can live different because the Spirit of God, you're born again, is in you. So Jesus, being full of the Holy Spirit, you know, we just spent nine months talking about the Holy Spirit. You think the Holy Spirit is an important part of our day-to-day -day life? I'm just telling you, without the Spirit's help, you're in trouble. So that's why every day I pray, Holy Spirit, come and make much of Jesus in me, that I might live for Him and honor Him and go and tell others about Him. I want people to know me. I want them to know there's forgiveness. I want them to know there's love. That this tempter, this enemy that deceives his people, that, that causes them to do all sorts of evil, that there's a different way, and it's the Jesus way. And that's everything that we're looking at for a long time now as we get into the Gospels here. But it goes in here and it says, And after he had fasted 40 days and nights, he then became hungry. And I can't even imagine, but then we also know it's supernatural. And it says, And the tempter came to him and said to him, and I, I believe this is just one of many, 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 many kinds of temptations. This is at the end of this 40 days that this is happening. If you are the Son of God, command these stones to become bread. And it says, But he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. And I just want to talk about this temptation for a moment. What's the enemy after here? See what he says in the beginning? If you are the Son of God. Prove yourself. <clears throat> Never been tempted that way, have you? You ever hear the voice of the enemy say, you think you're really a child of God? I look at this and it's so powerful because, I mean, Jesus is hungry. So he's tired. It's at the end of the 40 days. The enemy comes at his weakest moment and attacks his identity. You know what I'm convinced of? The reason many of us walk so crippled as believers and frustrated as believers is we don't understand our identity. We don't understand what's happened to us now that we're in Christ. See, Jesus, the good news is, he had no doubt. He knows exactly who he is and why he's come. Does that mean that the temptation wasn't hard? No. He's fully human. He's emptied himself, according to Philippians chapter 2. This is an onslaught, a full attack from the enemy, but Jesus is full of the Holy Spirit. And he stands. I think some of the fascinating things that always hit me when I look at this, and I think about how the enemy comes to attack our identity. And I, I, all through my life, from the time I got saved, and then when you struggle and you don't do so well, I mean, I hear the accuser. I mean, that's his name. Accuser. Deceiver. Liar. He's a father of lies. He comes as an angel of light. All those kind of things. And yet, we look at this, and Jesus says, it's, all, it's written, the man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Do you understand how important it is for you to know the word? Let me tell you a couple things here. The word I'm talking about is not just the written word. Some of you are going, what? you got to know this, though, because it is a lamp under our feet to lead us where? To the living word who is Jesus. Doesn't it make more sense when you quote John 14, 6, then Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. And there's no other way to follow except for him. But he's the way, the truth, and the life. I find my life in Christ. I also think it's fascinating that later on Jesus took a few loaves of bread and fish and made all sorts of bread <coughs> and fish for those who were coming to hear. 
I don't know if we understand. I, I, I really believe that, you know, from the time Jesus was born, the enemy was trying to kill him, trying to destroy him, trying to stop him, because he knew and he remembered what the Father said in the garden that through the seed of the woman will come a man who will crush your head. He's going to destroy you, all your works. But the identity issue, I mean, do you understand that in Colossians it tells us that you've been rescued from the domain of darkness and brought into the kingdom of light? That you're now an heir of Christ Jesus. But the same power and visions that tells us to raise Jesus from the dead also raised you. Abides in you, that same power. That we're seated with him in the heavenly places. Isn't that interesting? We now, right now, are seated with him in heavenly places. So where's the heavenly places? Right here. But you're no longer in the kingdom of darkness. You're in the kingdom of light. And he says, seated far above all rule, authority, power, and dominion. So when I'm thinking about the whole thing about temptation, when you look at this, Jesus is saying, we can now proclaim to the heavenlies, he says this in Ephesians as well, the truth of who Jesus is. Proclaim. Man, when I've been in the midst of the battles, and the enemy is coming against me, and sometimes it's on the hills of where I, I blew it in a temptation, that I'm running back to Jesus, and I hear the enemy's lies. I hear the accusations. I hear, you know, how can God love you that you failed again? Anybody ever fail the same thing more than twice? <laughs> can I say some of the reasons I used to pull off my, I call it my ugly stick to beat myself so bad, was I didn't fully understand what Jesus had done for me. I didn't fully understand my identity. I'm no longer called a sinner. You're no longer called a sinner if you're in Christ. You're called a saint. And the reason that's true is because Jesus didn't just die for your sins. He fulfilled all the righteous requirements of the law on your behalf and mine. <coughs> now, my whole life, from the time I get saved till I see Jesus face to face, is learning how to be a Christian. And what I mean by that, learning how to walk as Jesus walked. Learning and allowing Him to have every area of my life. Because it says, He who began a good work in you will bring it to completion. So it tells me I'm to fix my eyes on Jesus, the author and the perfecter of my faith. But we so often go this way and we try to become our own healer. The only way things fall off is when you get your eyes in the right place, get your focus in the right place. You're not drawn away when you're focused in the right place. The Spirit of God fills you enables you, equips you, gifts you. <laughs> Woo! Meaning, do you really know your identity? <coughs> You're not the same person. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's what? A new creation? The old is gone, the new has come. And we're not saying the old man is gone. The old nature is gone. We're saying the old way of the law is gone. It has no jurisdiction over me because it's been fulfilled in Christ. And I'm in the new way of the Spirit. I've been redeemed by the blood. So now it's about, if I'm not careful, I, I spend my whole life trying to be perfect instead of walking with the one who is perfect. And can I tell you that those are drastically different? Know your identity. So secondly, it goes here. I love this. It says, Then the devil took him into a holy city and had him stand on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, If you are the Son of God, there's that question again, throw yourself down, for it is written, He will command his angels concerning you, and on their hands they will bear you up, so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. So what's the enemy after here? I think there's a couple things. Again, he's after his identity. He's still attacking his identity. Don't you understand, if he can get you to not believe what Jesus says about you, you won't live a very productive life. You won't live what we call the abundant life. 
you'll live a frustrated, miserable Christian, quote, life. And that's where I see most people. Now, don't misunderstand me. I'm not saying, if you think at all, because there's a whole movement that says you can live however you want, God loves you. I am not saying that. If you can live however you want, you don't have the Holy Spirit. Period. You understand what I'm saying? Because I can't live how I used to and be okay. When I try, if I'm tempted and I go over here, I'm miserable over here. Did you ever hear that? I deserve a break. <laughs> you know, just relax. It's no big deal. Can I just say the pattern of sin doesn't have a lot of it. You start walking down that kind of a path and it's going deeper and deeper and deeper and you'll end up in a place you never thought you'd be. And it'll destroy your life. But when you can recognize that as your enemy, see the lie of the of the world and the devil and the flesh is, this is going to be so much fun. And it's funny, you know, sin is kind of fun. Until you get caught. But it's not fun when you really know the truth. Can I just say, I've never had a better, I've never had more fun. I've never been more excited. I've never lived a more adventurous life since I gave my life to Jesus. There's nothing greater than following Jesus. Anytime I get off track, it's not any fun over there. It's such a lie. It's a lie. We believe the lie. So the enemy comes and wants us to believe the lie. You ever hear the lie, you'll never get free of that? Want to bet? It's funny, Jesus said in John 8 that he came that we might be free. Huh. Jesus lied? He doesn't lie. We can be free, but we got to have the Spirit. So here he is. He's attacking his identity again, but he's doing something more than that. Yeah, I believe he's also attacking the love of the Father towards him. If, God, if you're really God's son, then the Father will protect you. And it's interesting here, here the enemy actually quotes what? The scripture. How important it is for you to know scripture that if the enemy uses the scripture, remember he comes as an angel of light. He's a great deceiver. He's a father of lies. He's a serpent of old. Jesus answers him, on the other hand, it is written, you shall not put the Lord your God to the what? The test. And I know none of you have ever done that. <laughs> Isn't it funny how we, we do that? How we test God? One of the ways we test God, and I think, I don't even know if we really understand that we're testing God, but there's certain things that we know we're supposed to do, right? We say weird things like, God, if you really want me to do that, give me a sign. It's like, I already showed you. <laughs> it's true, though, isn't it? I love it when people tell me, this just drives me crazy. I'm just waiting to see what God wants me to do. I said, we just turn around and hand over. Can't you go hard? Pretty obvious he gave us the marching orders, didn't he? Matthew 28, 18 through 20, when Jesus came to the disciples and said, What? All authority in heaven and earth have given to me? Therefore go and do nothing! <laughs> go and make disciples of all nations. Baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you and what? And surely I'm with you to the end of the age. My question is, I turn around and quote that and say, have you done any of that yet? Get going. Well, I just believe God might have a special call for me. You can't steer a park car. Get moving. But we put God to the test all the time. It's like we're lying to ourselves. God already told you what to do. Do it. I'm not being mean saying this, but how many of you are making disciples? How many of you are teaching somebody what the Word says? Just do it one-on-one. -on -one. It's not hard. You don't have to have a degree. You just have to have a Bible. You don't have to have all the answers. You can wrestle with it together. This is our blueprint. This is our love letter. This is our road map. This is the light under our feet. This is what leads us in the presence of Jesus. This is what teaches us what pleases God and doesn't please God. This is what teaches what it means to forgive and to, to live and to share. And to, oh, 
Paul there? I always love it when somebody says, well, I read it once. I said, wow, do you know it all? I've read it thousands of times, and I'm still learning. In fact, I, I feel like I know less. Have you ever heard the enemy, just like he was doing here with Jesus? You think the Father really loves you? Why would you go through what you're going through? Anybody been through a trial and ever thought you heard, where are you going? Can I just tell you that he's been there already and he already defeated that? Can I just tell you that sin and sickness and disease is going to be here until he comes back? Can I just tell you that real faith kicks in when everything isn't okay? Because what is happening through that trial, that test, just like we're talking, is it going to bring out the faith in you, the trust in you, or is it going to bring out what? Unbelief? Doubt, fear. All those feelings come, but you don't have to get into them, right? Jesus was tempted with all those thoughts and feelings. I'm going to be tempted with all those thoughts and feelings, but am I going to cave to that? And ask God, you've got to prove yourself to me, and you better help me, or I don't believe. I had a guy say that before. God loves one more thing. I'm going to be sick and sick and sick and God. I'm like, look at me. Good luck. And there's people out there that believe everybody should be healed. We shouldn't be sick. All those kinds of things. And I read the Apostle Paul and Barnabas and a couple others were so sick they, des they desired not even to live. They were so sick. Here they were healing everybody else, but God allowed them to be sick. That happens a lot. But you know what? I've also heard the Lord say to me when I'm praying for someone who's older that's saved and redeemed. And I've heard him say, who are you trying to rescue him from? Psalm 116, 13 says, The Lord rejoices in the death of the saints, and that just blows our mind. God looks at life so different than we do. So trials and tribulations and pain and suffering, in fact, are a part of a great part of the message in the New Testament. Prepare yourself to suffer as Christ has suffered. We still like it. <coughs> so the enemy comes in those moments and he wants you, you sure? You know? He doesn't heal you, you think he loves you? Your house doesn't sell and you lose it. You think he loves you? I mean, God was with you. Wouldn't he have done that? I mean, I've heard all those lies. Have you? Do you know him well enough to know that I know that I know that he has me and I'm okay? Because at the end of the story, I'm going to be all right. I'm going to go through trials on this side. Unfortunately, if we're really honest, we cause most of our trials. <laughs> I love this. It goes on. It says this. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to him, all these things I will give you if you fall down and what? Worship me. <laughs> then Jesus said to him, I don't think it was go saying, I think he said, go! For it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and serve him only. It's interesting in Luke, it says the devil left him for a more opportune time. We kind of say, okay, you went through all this, it's over. Can I just say this was just the beginning of the battle that Jesus had with him? He's declared war. We're going to get into that war as we get through, get into this text, but he's declaring war. And the enemy here ultimately is after our allegiance, our worship. Isn't that something? James literally teaches us when it talks about submit to God and resist the devil. And he, he uses about 11 words about submitting to God and a whole bunch of words about resisting the devil in that passage. But in there, literally, when you study that out, it's the idea that when you don't resist him and submit to God instead, you follow him Don't you just hate that thought? I mean, really. But it's true. On the times that we don't go the way we're supposed to go, you either follow the Lord or you follow the enemy. 
And you're like, how do you know that? Can't I just go my own way? Good luck with that. Going your own way is the enemy's way. I think about Isaiah 53, 6, as we all like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way. The Lord laid on him the iniquity of us all. And my question here then, one of the things I was thinking about, is one of the things Jesus said in John 5.19, if you look it up 5.19 and 20, the Gospel of John, is that I only do what the Father shows me. I do exactly what he does. I do nothing on my own. Can you imagine if we ever got to a place where we can say that? I think I'll be able to say that when I get to glory. But I catch this. I don't know why you, you've heard me say this many times, but I once in a while find myself running into myself. Right? So how do we do this? You know, I look at the passages here, and I think overall, we're, without the Holy Spirit, we don't have a chance. And I've quoted these many times. We can think of 1 Corinthians 2.12. It says, we, us, have not received the spirit of the world. But what? The spirit that comes from God. That we may understand what God has freely given us. What has he given us? Jesus. Victory through Jesus. Redemption through Jesus. Forgiveness through Jesus. New life through Jesus. The new domain, the realm that we abide in called the kingdom of life. Seated with Christ in heavenly places, far above all rule, authority, power, and dominion. I think of Ephesians chapter 6, then, verses 10 and following, says, Our battle is not against what? Flesh and blood, but what? Principalities and powers and spirits and wicked places and authorities. But if you read earlier, it says, Because we've been raised with Christ, through the same power that reached from the dead, abides in us, we're seated with Christ in heavenly places, we're now seated far above all those principalities and powers and authorities. So in there, when the Apostle Paul says, stand firm. When you've done everything to stand firm, stand firm then. How do you stand firm? The armor of God is all about being dressed in Christ. I met a guy one day, he says, I pray on the armor every day. I said, what's it mean? I don't know, but I pray it on. <laughs> I'm like, okay. The armor's about being dressed in Christ. Can I tell you that's your inheritance if you're in Christ? Not like I have to try to force the helmet of salvation on the breastplate of righteousness or the belt buckle of truth. It's all there. But when you walk in it. And the only reason I can stand firm now is because I'm in Christ. 1 Corinthians 3.16, what's it say? Don't you know that you yourselves are God's temple and God's spirit abides in you? 6.19 says the same thing, but it goes on to say, don't you know that you're not your own? You've been bought with a price. What? The blood of Christ. <coughs> Look at 2 Corinthians with me. Chapter 10. Old man. I'm just getting started. 2 Corinthians chapter 10 verses 3 through 5. Listen to what it says. It's powerful. It says, Though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh, okay? For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but are divinely powerful for the destruction of fortresses, every stronghold of the enemy. It says, we are destroying speculations and every lofty thing raised up against the knowledge of God. And we are taking every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. How do you live right? Take your thoughts captive. Keep your focus on Jesus. Realize the strength and the power comes through what? Being a spirit-filled believer. You know, Ephesians chapter 2 says, all of us at one time call the spirit of the air. And it goes on to talk about the enemy. We have a different spirit. We don't have the spirit of the world anymore. We have the spirit of God. But we understand fully what he's done for us. We might understand fully that we're in Christ. We may understand fully our identity. So the question is, how do we deal with these temptations? Because, you know, temptation in itself is not sin, right? So we just read, you take every lie and petition that sets itself up against the knowledge of God, every speculation, and you take it captive to the Lord, right? 
So here in 1 Corinthians 10, verses 13, it says this. No temptation is overtaking you, but such is common to man. And God is faithful, right? Who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able. But with the temptation will provide the way of escape also, so that you will be able to endure it. Now, I want to end with this, and we're going to be here for a while. But we have weapons of warfare in our right hand and our left. We are dressed in Christ. It's your inheritance. You don't have to try to put on the armor of God. You just got to keep your focus on what? The author and perfect of your faith. These are what he's given us. This is what's true of us now. I'm not on my own. I'm not trying to fight this fight in my own strength. I do this in the name of the Lord. I do this under the Spirit's leading. I, I walk and keep in step with the Spirit, as Scripture says. But I think it's interesting here. It says, No temptation has overtaken you such as common man, and God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted, what? Beyond what you are able. And now, I can talk to people, and they'll tell me, there was more than I could resist. More than I was able. Can I just say... I'd like to say this in another way. There's no temptation to have you. There's always a way of escape. Now here's what is confusing. Some people talk about little ways of escape. Can I just say what the way of escape is? Jesus. Fixing your eyes on the author with the of your faith. It's not that you can open a window, but you can die through and get out of that place. Even though maybe you need to turn around and walk away, right? If you're tempted in something, you don't go hang out in the place you're tempted. I won't fail. Boom. It's like saying, see, I call that the Isle of Temptation. <laughs> you know how I don't eat anything over there? Is I never pick anything up, ever. Because <laughs> I eat one, I eat five. Right? I'm glad you guys enjoy that. But, I know me. If there's chocolate chip cookies in my house, I have a philosophy. Eat them all and they're gone. <laughs> With the biggest glass of milk you can drink. And just eat them. Then you don't have to worry about it anymore. Because what happens to me, in the back of my mind, I'm not taking a cap, I'm just holding a sip there. But I'm thinking, chocolate chip cookies over there. <laughs> You know how much you like chocolate chip cookies? <laughs> no, I'm just using that as an example of any sin, though. Right? Man, if you're somebody who struggles with things on the internet, what can't you do by yourself? Be on the internet! Right? So it's all those kind of things. So, but the way of escape is Jesus, right? Turn your focus back to the Lord. Your Redeemer. And guess what? He's the perfecter and the author of your faith. Do you understand that? He's the help. He doesn't leave you or forsake you. He's the one, according to Philippians 4.13, that I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. That's not golfing a better game next week. Or winning at billiards. Or being the best tennis player or pickleball player. No matter what it is, it's not any of that. It's what it is. It's giving me the strength actually live this life in such a way that men might see the light of Jesus in me in such a way that they want to know him. Now listen. I just want to wrap up with this. If you're not taking the things that are tripping you up captive to the Lord, you're never going to get through them. You will never be free. And I just say I've seen things like that in so many of my friends' lives. Through the years, I've lived long enough now, and I've seen a lot of people that I thought were doing great shipwreck their faith. Why? Because they had hidden things in the closet. But eventually, they come out. Your sin will find you out. And then it just shipwrecked them. Instead of just dealing with it, repenting, they ran. Listen, don't let the enemy lie to you that it's okay to keep that thing in your life. The Spirit of God is faithful to uproot those things. But it literally tells us in Ephesians to bring out what's in here into the light. Why? So we can see it for what it really is.
And now there's no temptation that isn't common to everybody, okay? So the lie of the enemy is saying, you're the only one! Oh, hockey puck. You're not that special. I'm not that special. But there's a real enemy and a real tempter. And he wants to destroy us. Jesus has beaten him on our behalf. Do you understand that? Would you stand with me as a court? In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. If it's your heart today, say, Lord Jesus, invade every area of my life. Send the Spirit to do His work. Help me not to live in a way that dishonors you. The Lord may make me a spirit-filled person. That I might walk in your way. And reflect your love. In Jesus' name. Amen. Dismissed. Thank you.